Recently, our client Tommy met his banker to discuss continuing his father's restaurant legacy. In us, he found a partner that understood the importance of passing the torch. First Horizon Bank. Let's find a way. Go to firsthorizon.com slash Tommy. Welcome to Mafia, a new podcast telling stories of America's criminal underworld. Gotti assumed the position of head of the Gambino family. And using the name Donnie Brasco, I was able to infiltrate the uh, Bonanno uh, crime family in New York City. Bugsy Siegel is an American mob legend. One man changed the whole texture and landscape of crime in America. Listen to Mafia every Wednesday on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your favorite shows. 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 10, 9, ignition sequence start. Space Nuts. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Space Nuts. Astronauts report it feels good. Hello again, and thank you for joining us on the astronomy podcast known as Space Nuts. I'm your host, Andrew Dunkley, and with me, as always, the expert from the Australian Astronomical Observatory, one Fred Watson. Hi, Fred. <laughs> Good day, Andrew. How are you? I'm very well. Uh, I'm very well. Are you uh, as nutty as ever? Because that's what we've got to be. <laughs> yes, I'm feeling a little shelled, but otherwise fine. Uh, <laughs> and you? Well, we'll just get to the kernel of the matter and no. we'll be fine in due course. <laughs> dear, oh dear, oh dear. Jordan Bennett. <laughs> Nut puns. The, yeah, world, the right. world probably doesn't need them. No, I don't think mm. we do either. <laughs> no, 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 definitely not. Now, today we're going to uh, investigate the latest on Planet Nine. We've talked about Planet Nine before, but it's back in the news because uh, there's mounting evidence that there is probably a Planet Nine, maybe a Planet Ten. They're talking Mars-sized object, which would put it in the realm of planet rather than planetoid. Uh, we're also going to look at that mystery radio signal, which appears to be coming from a, a, a red dwarf. Or is it... And uh, we investigate a, a couple of listener questions as well. But first, Fred, what's the latest on Planet Nine? Um, early last year, the news broke that a group of very distinguished planet hunters uh, in America had hypothesized the existence of a planet way beyond the orbit of Neptune. In fact, <clears throat> if I remember rightly, its average distance is something like 20 or 30 times the distance of Neptune from the sun. So something very far out in the depths of the solar system. The evidence for that was that uh, the belt of icy asteroids that we call the Kuiper Belt, uh, once again, way beyond the orbit of Neptune, but not quite as far, that this belt of icy asteroids showed hints that the orbits of these asteroids were being shepherded by something a long way beyond, a kind of gravitational pull that would uh, sort of, you know, distribute these orbits in a certain way so that mm. they're not just kind of randomly distributed. And, and indeed, a search was, under, uh, was kicked off, was embarked on uh, for this mystery planet. The problem is that at the kind of distances that were hypothesized, uh, even a, a Neptune-sized object would be very, very faint. And it, that uh, problem was compounded by the fact that the scientists thought that the expected region of space where this would be was basically in the direction of the Milky Way. So you're looking at a, uh, you know, a region of the sky which is rich in stars, and you're trying to find something moving very slowly among those stars. Uh, it was certainly um, a needle in a haystack task, and so far has not produced any uh, any evidence that this planet is there any direct evidence mm -hmm. meanwhile meanwhile andrew uh, back in the, back in the usa um, other scientists have re-examined the original hypothesis and um, there have been some criticisms now made of the uh, original idea that Planet Nine exists at all. Oh. And they come about because there is a suggestion that what you're seeing in the way these uh, orbits are distributed is not a real alignment of, of, uh, of orbits of Kuiper Belt objects, but the result of what are called selection effects. In other words, you're only seeing certain things that are out there some of the stuff that's out there you're not seeing because of observational issues the wrong time of year wrong kind of weather all of those things selection effects are a problem that dogs 
uh, actually the whole science of astronomy, you've got to be really careful if you're surveying for uh, for something and you're looking for something, <clears throat> you've got to be careful that, that the very technique that you're using to find this doesn't actually lead you uh, along the wrong path. Mm -hmm. We find it in a number of different issues. So that's the suggestion that, um, that this uh, the, the hypothesized planet nine doesn't exist, that uh, it uh, is, uh, it, the evidence is actually uh, all cluttered up by the selection effect. However, uh -huh. <laughs> meanwhile, again, um, there is some evidence in the, the uh, angular tilt, the, the sort of tilt with relation to the plane of the solar system, of the orbits of these, some Kuiper belt objects, that maybe there is something out there disturbing them, uh, but not as big as the uh, the uh, the planet nine, the hypothesized planet nine. And as you mentioned earlier, uh, something the size of Mars might be doing this. But once again, it's so far out in the depths of the solar system, it is going to be very, very hard to find that. And actually, we've got less of an idea where to search just because uh, the, the, you know, the evidence has changed. The smoking gun is now about tilted orbits rather than orbits aligning. Okay. So um, we're kind of back to square one almost in the Planet Nine search. It is certainly something that's not going to go away. Uh, I'm sure Mike Brown and his team uh, are, I, I, I would guess that they are, um, they're, they're, they're doing their best to eliminate any selection effects and, and revisit this whole issue. So uh, you and I should keep an eye on it, I mm. think, because um, you never know, Planet Nine, Planet Nine might turn up out of the woodwork at some point uh, down the track. Yeah, it's interesting because I'm sure people are wondering why it's so hard to find something relatively close to us when uh, we can find planets that are light years away. Uh, we can see those or we can at least detect those, but we can't really figure out something that's in our own neighbourhood. Is, is it just because of the, the circumstantial difference? Yeah, it's the technology that you're using. So the, the planets uh, that we discover around other stars, and you're quite right, they are light years away, um, are all found by indirect methods, either the fact that the planet uh, transits across the disk of its parent star, and that causes a dimming of the parent star, or that the planet pulls its parent star uh, to one side and the other, revealing uh, its presence by the motion of the parent star. These are these are, um, you know, quite well-defined methods. And the bottom line is that you're looking at something bright. You're looking mm. at the star itself. With this, you're actually looking at the reflected light that has travelled, you know, <laughs> sort of 30, 40 perhaps times the distance of Neptune out from the sun and then back again into the inner solar system. Uh, and, and it really is a needle in a haystack search. It's a very different kind of problem. Mm. So maybe probably no planet nine. Uh, which means there's no planet 10, because if there is a planet 10, it becomes planet 9. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> yeah. So probably no planet 10 either. No, so the, the inventory at the moment is eight planets and a whole lot of other stuff. <laughs> yeah, a lot of junk in the Kuiper belt, <laughs> although fascinating <laughs> junk. Pluto yes, it is to indeed be amazing. Fasc yeah. Totally All right. fascinating. Definitely something to keep an eye on. Um, I'm sure a lot of people are hoping there are other planets in our solar system, but uh, the evidence is certainly stacking against that. You're listening to Space Nuts with Andrew Dunkley and Fred Watson. Zero G and I feel fine. Space Nuts. Now, Fred, a, a story that's certainly been making headlines um, in general news, not just in the astronomical world, and that is this mystery radio signal which appears to be coming from a red dwarf. But I have seen a few headlines uh, over the last few days suggesting that this may be also, like Planet Nine, a non-event. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty good. Two, two non-events out of... Yes, um, we've, we've been talking about <laughs> nothing, <two>. basically. <laughs> well, no, the signal's real. It just the might signal's not be, real, that, that's correct. It might not be real. what we think it might be. So this is a story uh, that starts off with uh, actually what until recently was the biggest single dish radio telescope in the world. <clears throat> this is the Arecibo dish. Uh, if I remember rightly, its diameter is 300 meters. Whoa. Uh, and it's unlike the Parkes radio dish, uh, you can't point it around the sky uh, because it sits in a natural hollow 
in the landscape in Puerto Rico. Oh, yeah, uh, this is the one that, that <clears throat> featured in the movie uh, Contact with Jodie Foster. I, I believe it did. Yes. That's right. I believe it okay. did. Um, so y you might think that limits it because it's just staring upwards. Uh, you can actually point it slightly in different directions because uh, um, at the at the focus of this dish, there is a, a cabin that contains the, uh, the receiving equipment and that can be moved around. And what that effectively does is points the dish slightly in different directions. Anyway, uh, this telescope, oh, by the way, it's no longer the biggest single dish telescope in the world because the Chinese now have one 500 meters in diameter, uh, which is um, which has just just been commissioned, in fact. And, is, and they're is already a, talking to the book. aliens. They're just not telling us. That could be true, but uh, <laughs> unlikely. We, we won't go there. No. Um, <laughs> the uh, the Arecibo work. Uh, one of the projects that uh, is being carried out on that telescope. Uh, by scientists in, in the United States is a campaign of looking at red dwarf stars that are known to have planets around them. Uh, the, the red dwarfs are, well, the name gives it away, they're small and red. They're smaller than our sun, they're cooler than our sun, which is why they're red. Uh, and in fact, they are relatively easy targets for the discovery of planets orbiting around them. Mm. And that's because um, you, you know the things we were just talking about blotting off the light of a of a small star by a large planet is actually going to produce a bigger signal than you know, than, than a, a, a big star on a small planet so uh, there are several uh, planets known around uh, red dwarf stars and what the scientists have been doing is looking at them with the radio telescope because there is a suspicion that uh, red dwarf stars emit much more energy in terms of what we would call solar flares in the case of the sun uh, these are flares they're, ob they're bursts of gas that come from the surface of the star and actually emit radio waves and are probably lethal to any uh, life forms on the planets around them. That's the that's the motivation for doing this to find out just how intensive uh, a radio and magnetic uh, environment there there is around these red dwarf stars. So uh, that's the reason why this work was embarked on, uh, and they've observed uh, I think something like eight of these stars. Of which one, uh, whose name is Ross 128, no doubt it is the uh, 128th star in a catalogue put together by uh, Dr. Ross. Uh, the the, um, uh, the the that particular star, Ross 128, has got uh, very unusual radio signals coming from it, or at least coming from di the direction uh, of this of this star. Mm. Um, they are, uh, they describe them as very peculiar uh, signals in the 10 minute dynamic spectrum that they obtain. That means, um, you know, these are sort of exposures of 10 minutes. Uh, and well, let me tell you what the description of these signals is. And then you and I can try and unpick that and you'll be as good at this as I am. Um, I'm, I'm not well, by... You know, I've been working in radio for a while. Yeah, you're a, you're it, a radio. It man, might just right. click. It might just click. I'm not a radio astronomer, uh, but um, I kind of hang around them, so I do know the sort of language that they talk. Right. It says, the signals consisted of broadband, quasi-periodic, non-polarised pulses with very strong dispersion-like features. What do you make of that, Andrew? No idea. <laughs> OK. <laughs> right. I'll figure it out. Yeah. Um, somebody <laughs> playing right. video well, games, I don't know. Could be quasi Bluetooth. Qu quasi-periodic uh, suggests that they're... They're not regular, but they they come in bursts. Mm. Um, you know, they're they're kind of almost periodic, but but not quite or semi-periodic. Um, uh, broadband suggests that they are not at a specific frequency. You know, in radio, you t tune into a particular frequency and listen yeah. listening to Andrew Dunkley on whatever <laughs> whatever broadcast platform he's talking on. Uh, these are broadband. They're they're not something you could tune in. Um, Non-polarized pulses suggests that they. Uh, are uh, uh, made, you know, they're, they're, they're the product of uh, an environment that is um, 
probably free from dust. Uh, dust tends to polarise uh, signals uh, coming through space, and by dust I mean something a bit like smoke. Mm. Um, and the dispersion-like features, uh, to me, I think mean that it's that the signals are going through a fairly dense medium, whether that's the atmosphere of the star or something else, we don't know. The bottom line is that these guys don't know either. Okay. Um, they, they say we do not know the origin of these signals, but there are three main possible explanations. They could be, first of all, emissions from the star itself, ROS 128, which are similar to the strongest kinds of solar flares that we have coming from the sun. Uh, they also speculate that they might be coming from another object in the same line of sight as, as ROS 128, because w with a big telescope like this, um, even, I should say, with a big telescope like this, you can't always pinpoint exactly what it is you're looking at. There might mm -hmm. be something lurking behind Ross 128 that's emitting the signals, and then, you, you know, all bets are off. You don't know what kind of source you're looking at. And finally, they wonder whether it is... Um, uh, a signal coming from uh, a, a, sat a satellite of the Earth, in other words, a, a, an artificial satellite uh, for communications, probably, uh, at a, in a very high orbit. Um, it would have to be a long way away because otherwise um, the satellite would whiz through the field of view of the telescope and the signal will be over and done with very quickly. Yeah. So th they are suggesting that there are possibilities but they really don't know what has happened since the first um, the first uh, announcement of this of this mysterious signal is that they've revisited uh, the star once again with with uh, other telescopes uh, including Arecibo uh, and they are looking at uh, the, the, the new data that have come from those they have not yet re released the new data not, not at the time that we are speaking Mm. It's, it, yeah, I mean, whenever we come across something like this, everybody gets very hopeful that it's that it's some kind of message, uh, a la the, 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 the movie Contact with Jodie Foster. Uh, it's almost ironic that it's the same place. But um, <laughs> yes. it, it always turns out to be the easily explainable. At, at this point in time, it's not, but it's it's probably you know you go with the theory if um that it's probably the the most obvious uh generally uh, that's the right yes yeah. that's the um it's the principle of um, occam's razor we mm. we take the the, the most likely which was, which was also brought up in uh, <laughs> there you go uh william of Ockham, uh, if i remember rightly he lived in the 15th century it uh, goes back a long way uh, but let me just add one footnote because there is a footnote to the discovery announcement of these mysterious signals which says um, in case you are wondering the recurrent aliens hypothesis is at the bottom of many other better explanations yes i'm sure it is yeah <laughs> so there you go but it's not the first time we've had mysterious signals or radio bursts discovered and some of those haven't been explained either so um, the, the 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 one that's uh, that still really cries out for explanation is the wow signal yes the famous wow signal which mm. is, does not yet have an explanation which they've started studying again to see if they can Figure yeah, it all out. Right. yeah, exactly. All right. Well, we'll keep an eye on this space or an ear on it or a radio receiver or whatever it is we need. Uh, very good. Uh, you're listening to Space Nuts, uh, Fred Watson and Andrew Dunkley. What a matchup! And what a tea, Mike. Metro PCS and the iPhone SE for $0 on a network that covers 99% of people in the U.S. Oh, impressive. <laughs> Play with the best. Switch to Metro PCS and get a 32 gig iPhone SE for zero dollars. Metro PCS. Coverage not available in some areas. Plus sales tax and ten dollar activation fee. Claim based on talking tax. Not valid for active numbers currently on our T-Mobile network or active on Metro PCS in the past 90 days. See store for details and terms and conditions. Okay, we checked all four systems and team with a go. Space nets. Can you hear that noise? Yes, I can. It's um, it's a horse next door. <laughs> Uh, because you know we live next door to a vet, and they occasionally bring horses into the to the vet surgery, which is on the same concrete slab as the house. So oh well, it, we'll just yeah. we'll just work through it, Fred. Yeah. We'll work through it. <laughs> Love it. Uh, it's almost like live radio. Uh, <laughs> now, Fred, uh, we we'll finish off today with one final question. Uh, we we love your audience questions, so keep them coming. You can certainly send them to us through our Facebook page. Uh, this question comes from uh, Bradley again. Bradley's uh, sent us some questions before. Uh, we've been recently talking about black holes, as you know, Fred. Um, 
and he says, how come we can see these black holes from a telescope, but we can't send a mini spacecraft to see them up close? Are they too far, too dangerous? What gives? Interesting question. Interesting question. Uh, indeed, it, it, it is. And thanks very much, Brad, because we do enjoy getting questions. Um, this is one that um, it's got lots of different facets, actually. Uh, the, we, of course, we can't actually see black holes at all uh, because they're black. <laughs> they uh, have such a strong gravitational field that they, they don't allow anything to escape. That's not quite true, but nearly, nearly true, uh, including light. Uh, so when we observe black holes, what we're always seeing is their effect on their environment. And usually it's what we call the accretion disk. It's this swirling mass of stars, bits of stars and gas and dust that are being sucked into the black hole in its um, immediate neighborhood. So that's the sort of stuff that we detect uh, from uh, telescopes. Um, why can't we send a mini spacecraft? Uh, uh, the main reason is that they're just too far. The distances involved are, you know, by far bigger than anything uh, in terms of distances in the solar system. Well, when you, when you uh, talk about the black hole in our galaxy, yes. it's, the cent you know, it's at the centre of our galaxy. Uh, we're talking about sending mini spacecraft to Alpha Centauri in, in you know, that's going to take two, two and a half years at the current technology. So how long it would take to send something to the centre of the galaxy is, <laughs> is phenomenal. Um, let's just revisit that because um, you, you're oh, right. 20, 20 that, years, wasn't it? Just yeah, that's right. 20, 20 years. Exactly. Two and a half. So, so th that's with, and that's not even with current technology, that's with technology that has yet to be developed. Mm. Uh, that's the um, Breakthrough Starshot project. That's so right. they're hoping to to use solar sails to, uh, and a laser to blast something at one third of the speed of light, uh, which, as you say, will take 20, 20 years to get to Alpha Centauri. There's no chance of stopping it. It's just got to take the pictures as it goes past. Yeah. So that's an object whose distance is just over four light years. The black hole at the center of our galaxy is 25,000 light years away. So, um, you know, it, it, you're absolutely right, Andrew, that it, it's just uh, mind-bogglingly distant. And really, the odds of us ever sending a spacecraft there, uh, even with technology that at the moment we can only, you know, dream about, mm. uh, the, the, the odds are that it's never going to happen. Um, there are other black holes closer, much smaller ones, uh, but they're still that distance is measured in thousands of light years, uh, perhaps tens of thousands of light years. So uh, yes, the answer is that they're too far. One just one footnote to this is that there is an experiment uh, which is uh, kind of uh, on the stocks at the moment, and I think um, the planning is well advanced. And the idea is to link. Uh, many of the world's principal radio telescopes to form the equivalent of a radio dish, the diameter of the Earth, um, and then to look at the black hole at the centre of our galaxy using that gigantic radio uh, synthesis telescope is the technical term, um, and look at uh, the um, actually for the first time to try and reveal what a black hole looks like with its accretion disk, with the, the way it bends light around it or radio signals equivalently, um, and try and get an image of this black hole. That's the uh, target of a, a whole group of radio scientists, which may yield results within the next year or so. So, um, Brad, watch out for this. Uh, we think uh, we might be uh, on the brink of actually seeing a black hole for the first time. Oh, that'd be exciting. Gee, I'm glad he asked the so. question because uh, yeah, yeah. it could lead to something. All right, we'll watch with interest as we do always. And thank you, Brad. And uh, anytime anyone wants to send us a question, please do. We're more than happy to give them a go. And if we don't know, we'll pretend you didn't send them. Now, uh, <laughs> that's just about it. <laughs> that's just about it from us. Uh, thank you, as always, Fred. Uh, it's a great pleasure, Andrew. Good to talk to you. We'll talk again soon. Very good. Uh, Fred Watson from the Australian Astronomical Observatory. And thank you for listening to Space Nuts, whether it's uh, on the radio or online, through whatever podcast platform you use. There are many. And don't forget about our sister podcast, Space Time, with Stuart Gary, which is on all those same podcast platforms. Um, from Andrew Dunkley, it is goodbye, and uh, we'll catch you next time on Space Nuts. Space Nuts. You've been listening to the Space Nuts podcast. Subscribe to the full podcast on iTunes, Audioboom, and Stitcher, or your favourite podcast distributor. 
This has been another quality podcast production from Tights.com. Welcome to Mafia, a new podcast telling stories of America's criminal underworld. Gotti assumed the position of head of the Gambino family. And using the name Donnie Brasco, I was able to infiltrate the uh, Bonanno uh, crime family in New York City. Bugsy Siegel is an American mob legend. One man changed the whole texture and landscape of crime in America. Listen to Mafia every Wednesday on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your favorite shows.